Hello students. Welcome back to your to your history class. I am Mrs. Jenny Shah and we were doing that we are doing the chapter displacing of indigenous people. This class we start with Australia. As in the America, human habitation in Australia has a long history also. The aborigines, that is a general name given to a number of different societies, the aborigines began to arrive on the continent over 40,000 years ago. It is possible even earlier than that. They came from New Guinea which was connected to Australia by a land bridge. In the native's tradition, they did not come to Australia, but they had always been there. The past centuries were called the dream time, something difficult for the Europeans to understand since the distinction between past and present is blurred. In the late 18th century, there were between 350 and 750 native communities in Australia, each with their own language. Even today, 200 of those languages are still spoken. There is another larger group of indigenous people living in the north called the Torres Strait Islanders. This, the term the aborigin used, is not used for these. The term aborigin is not used for the Torres Strait Islanders, as they are believed to have been migrated from elsewhere and they belong to an altogether different race. So, together, they make up 2.4% of Australia's population in 2005. Australia is a sparsely populated and even now most of the towns are along the coast because the central region is an arid desert. So British also first arrived in Australia on the coast in 1770. How did the Europeans reach Australia? In 1606, Dutch travellers saw Australia, they sighted Australia. 1642, Tasman lands on the island later named Tasmania. 1770, James Cook reaches Botany Bay, which was named New South Wales. And 1788, British penal colony formed and Sydney was found. The story of the interaction between the European settlers, the native people <clears throat> and the land in Australia has many points of similarity to the story of America. Although it nearly began 300 years later. Initial reports from Captain Cook and his crew about the encounters with the natives are enthusiastic about their friendliness. There was a sharp reversal of feelings on the part of the British when Cook was killed by a native, not in Australia but in Hawaii. As we have often seen, a single incident of this nature was used by the colonizers to justify the subsequent act of violences towards the other people. Up original production has been dramatically disturbed by the British presence. The arrival of thousands of hungry mouths, followed by hundred more, 
but unprecedented pressure on local food resources. So what would the Daruk people have thought of all this? To them, a large scale destruction of sacred places and strange violent behavior towards their land was inexplainable. The newcomers seemed to knock down trees without any reason. They were not even making canoes out of them. They were not gathering the bush for honey or catching animals. Stones were being moved and stacked together. Clay was dug up, shaped and cooked. Holes were made in the ground. Large, unwieldy structures were built. At first, they may have equated the clearing with the creation of a sacred ceremonial ground. Perhaps they thought a huge ritual gathering was to be held. Dangerous business from which they should steer where they should steer were clear. There is no doubt that the Daruks subsequently avoided the settlement, for the only way to bring them back was by an official kidnapping. So this was written uh, in 1790. It is a description of a uh, area in Sydney. So these are the sources, the articles that give us an insight into the life at that time. So the native people did not foresee that in the 19th and 20th centuries, nearly 90% of them would die by the exposure to germs, by the loss of their lands and resources, and in battles against the settlers. The experiment of settling Brazil with Portuguese convicts had been abandoned when their violent behavior provoked angry reprisals from the natives. The British had adopted the same practice in the American colonies until they became independent. Then they continued it in Australia. Most of the early settlers were convicts who had been deported from England. And when their jail term ended, they were allowed to live as a free person in Australia only on the condition that they did not return back to Britain. With no risk recourse but to make a life for themselves in this land so different from their own, they felt no hesitation about ejecting natives from the land and taking over it for cultivation. The, econ the economic development of Australia under European settlement was not as varied as in America. Vast sheep farms and mining stations were established over a long period and with much labor followed by vineyards and wheat farming. These came to form the basis of the country's prosperity when the states were united and it was decided that a new capital would be built for Australia in 1911. One name suggested for the capital was Wool Wheat Gold and ultimately it was called Canberra. Canberra is a native word which meant a meeting place. Some natives were employed in the farms under the conditions of work so harsh that it was little difficult from it was just a little different from slavery. Later on, Chinese immigrants provided cheap labor, as in Cal just like in California, but unease about being dependent on non-whites led to the government in both countries to ban Chinese immigrants. In 1974, such was the popular fear that dark people from South Asia or Southeast Asia might migrate to Australia in large numbers that there was a government policy to keep the non-white people out. 
So this is about Australia. The native people from New Guinea have come 40,000 years before or maybe even earlier. There is a group of people, Torres Strait Islanders, which are considered different from the native people. They are a group of indigenous people who are living in the north of the continent. The early settlers of Australia were the convicts who were deported from England on the condition that they could not return back again. And they ejected the natives from the land and they took over the land for cultivation without any remorse. The natives were then employed in the farms and later on Chinese, were start, Chinese immigrants started to provide cheap labor. But Australian government was very scared of being dependent on non-white people and so they followed a non-white policy to keep the people of South Asia or Southeast Asia away. The British had adopted the same practice in American colonies until those colonies became independent. Then they continued it in Australia. Most of the early settlers were convicts who had been deported from England and when their jail term ended, they were allowed to live as free people in Australia on the condition that they did not return to Britain with no recourse but to make a life for themselves in a land so different from their own they felt no hesitation about ejecting the natives from the land and taking it over for cultivation this is the development graph of australia 1850 self government was granted to the australian colonies 1851, Chinese coolie immigration started, but it was stopped by a law. 1851 to 1961 were the gold rushes. 1901, formation of Federation of Australia with six states. 1911, Canberra was established as a capital. And 1948 to 75, 2 million Europeans migrate to Australia. In Australia, the aboriginal people were seen to both a people without history and they are seen as a people without a future. They are driven by a belief that aboriginal people will die out soon. And so the Australian government began a process of taking up original people from their families and placing them in European homes and foster care so that they could survive. This process began in 1885 and continued all the way till 1970. These children are called the lost generation because they were forcibly separated from their families and heritage. The winds of change. People were electrified by a lecture by the anthropologist W. E. H. W. E. H. Stanner, which was entitled The Great Australian Silence, the silence of historians about the aborigines. From 1970, as was happening in North America, there was an eagerness to understand natives, not an anthropological curiosity, but as communities with distinct cultures, unique ways of understanding nature and climate, and a sense of community 
which had vast body of stories, textile, painting and carving skills, which should be understood and recorded as well as respected. Under all this was the urgent question which Henry Reynolds later articulated in a powerful book. Why weren't we told? This condemned the practice of writing Australian history as though it had begun with the Captain Cook's discovery. So after this, the way the history was written changed. Since then, university departments have been instituted to study native cultures, galleries of native art have been added to art galleries, museums have been enlarged to incorporate dioramas and imaginatively designed rooms explaining the native culture and natives have began to write their own life histories. This has been a wonderful effort. It has also occurred at a critical time because if native cultures had remained ignored, by this time much of the culture would have been forgotten. From 1974, multiculturalism has been the official policy in Australia which gives equal respect to native cultures and to different cultures of the immigrants from Europe as well as Asia. From 1970, the term human rights began to be heard at the meetings of the UNO and other international agencies. The Australian public realized with dismay that in contrast to USA, Canada and New Zealand, Australia had no treaties with the natives formalizing the takeover of the land by the Europeans. The government had always termed the land of Australia as terra nullis. That means it belonged to nobody. There was also a long agonizing history of children of mixed blood that was the native European being forcibly captured and separated from their native relatives. Agitation around these questions led to the inquiries and two important decisions. One, to recognize that the natives had strong historical bonds with the land which was sacred to them and which should be respected. And number two, that while the past act could not be undone, there should be a public apology for the injustice done to the children in an attempt to keep the white and colored people apart. So, in 1968, the anthropologist W. E. H. Stanner, he delivered a lecture which, said, which was named as the Great Australian Silence. The silence of the historians about the origin about, of the orb origins. So, he spoke the question that everyone had in their heart on a public platform and this touched a lot of people. After this, there was an attempt to study the natives as communities with distinct cultures. And Henry Reynolds, in his book, Why Weren't We Told, he condemned the practice of writing Australian history as if everything began with Captain Cook's discovery. By 1974, multiculturalism was adopted as an official policy in Australia which gave equal respect to native and all cultures. Australia had not made treaties with natives when their land was taken up by the Europeans. The government termed the land of Australia as terra nullius, meaning belonging to nobody. Children of mixed blood were forcibly captured and separated from their native relatives. 
agitation against these issues led for two important decisions. Number one, that the natives had such strong bonds with the land and this should not be ignored. In fact, it should be respected. And number two was a national sorry day as apology for the children lost from the 1920s to the 1970s. So these two things were done. 26th May is the national sorry day. Judith Wright, an Australian writer, was a champion of the rights of the Australian Aborigines. She wrote many moving poems about the laws created by keeping the white people and the natives apart. There is one poem in your textbook which is written by Odorgo Nonukal, Two Dream Times. Kethi, my sister, with the torn heart, I don't know how to thank you for your dreamtime stories of joy and grief written on paper bark. You were one of the dark children I wasn't allowed to play with. Riverbank campers, the wrong color, I couldn't turn you white. So it was late I met you, late I began to know. They hadn't told me the land I loved was taken out of your hands. How nicely written. So Judith Wright was an Australian writer and she was a champion of the rights of the Australian up origins. She wrote many moving poems about the loss that was created by keeping the white people and the native people apart. A new era. The resurgence of hard paternalism. Earlier this year, a report was issued. This is, I think, uh, 2012 or something. Huh? This is not recent. It's 2007, actually. Okay. So earlier this year, a report was issued on the status of 60 of original settlement camps in Northern Territory, Australia. The report found that alcohol drugs, pornography and unemployment were responsible for the high level of child abuse, child pornography and a breakdown of the aboriginal culture. On 21st June 2007, Prime Minister John Howard labelled this a national emergency and sent police and soldiers into the aboriginal settlement camp. They are to enforce a ban on alcohol and pornography, order compulsory health checks on children under 16, and stop welfare payments to parents whose children failed to attend school. In what ways does this policy reflect a continuity of racist attitude towards Aboriginal people? And what does the interpretation of problems in the camp suggest about? while Australians view of Australian history. So even today, uh, 1974 is not a very long time ago. Uh, that was when the Australian policy ended and the Asian immigrants were then allowed entry into the land. 1992, Australian High Court declares that terra nullius was legally invalid and it, and it started to recognize the claims of the native people on the land before 19, before 1770. 1995, a national inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander children from their fa families is held. And 26th May, uh, in 1999, 26th May was declared as a national sorry day, which was an, an apology day for the children who were lost from 1820 to 1970 because of this policy okay so this brings us to the end of this chapter there are a few questions in your textbook which we will find an answer to together when we do the question and answer of this chapter 
but I'm going to do the next chapter first before we go to the question and answers. Okay, so I will uh, do the notes next class, which I want you all to sit and write down. All right, with this, children, I end today's class. I hope it was eye opening to you to realize that Australia did not recognize its own, did not uh, give any recognition to their own history, and they were very late. And how important history is, and how lost you feel when you do not have history of your own generation, of your own people. So, with this, children, I end this class. I leave you on this thought on how important history is. Stay home, stay safe, take care, keep learning. Thank you.